Nicholas Paul Wolterstorff is the Noah Porter Professor of Philosophical Theology at Yale University. How would you like to have a title like that? He's a renowned scholar, a prolific writer. He's written about a number of wide-ranging philosophical and theological subjects. He's brilliantly um, prepared for what he does. He teaches on epistemology, metaphysics, the philosophy of education, and he also helped to establish the Society of Christian Philosophers. 1987, Nicholas Paul Wolterstorff published his only non-philosophical work. It was called The Lament for a Son. In a series of short essays, the great philosopher recounted how he drew on his Christian faith to cope with the death of his 25-year-old son, Eric. He said, I do not try to put it behind me, to get over it, to forget it. If someone asks, who are you? Tell me about yourself. I say, I am one who lost a son. I struggle indeed to go beyond my grief, but owning my grief is redemptive. I will not and cannot disown it. I shall remember Eric in my grief. It's hard to imagine the love of a father that he has for his son. I think that's one of the reasons why the gospel is so precious because it's all around this theme. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The love of a father for a son. And that is the backdrop for our study today. The love of a father for his son. Like the first miracle that we studied last week, the second one, that is today's message, took place in a little village called Cana of Galilee. Now, if you ever visit the Holy Land, and I hope you get a chance to do that sometime if you haven't already, usually the first two or three days that you spend are in Tiberias, which is in northern part of Israel. There you will see the Sea of Galilee. There you will see places like Cana and Joppa and other places you've read about in the Bible. And it's interesting that the two miracles that begin the sign miracles in John's Gospel, both of them took place in this little village called Cana of Galilee. The two miracles have more in common than just their location. In both of these miracles, the word of the Lord is preeminent. Jesus speaks, and water turns to wine. Jesus speaks, and a young man is healed 20 miles away. Both miracles involve servants who were the first to recognize that a miracle had happened, and both took place in a home. But there are also some differences in these miracles. The first was associated with a marriage, and the second with an anxious father. The first with joy at a wedding, and the second with the sorrow of a family. At the first miracle, Jesus added gladness to a feast. At the second miracle, he banished sadness from a heart. Two miracles of Jesus, and the Bible tells us they are given to us as sign miracles. When we see these two miracles side by side, what we learn is that Jesus is equal to either occasion. He has a place in all of our circumstances. If we invite him to come into our times of happiness, he will increase our joy. And if we call on him in our times of sorrow, anxiety, or bereavement, he brings consolation and comfort and a joy that doesn't come from this world. The Bible calls it a joy and a peace that pass understanding. As we open our Bibles today to John chapter 4, Jesus has just returned from a ministry trip into Samaria where he met the woman at the well. If you have a Bible like mine, over here on this page is our story for today. If you look on the other page, you'll see the word Samaria. This is where the woman of Samaria, the Samaritan woman, that's where the story is. Now we turn the page and we come to our story for today. And the story begins in John chapter 4, verse 46, with Christ and the great sorrow. Verse 46 says, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water into wine. 
And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, in Jesus' day, a nobleman was like a senator in our day. I call this message the Savior and the Senator's Son. A nobleman was like a high-standing aristocratic person who was in the government. He was probably an official in Herod's court. This would have made him a man of considerable wealth and power, like many of the senators in our day. But his position at a time like this was of no value to him at all. His son was sick, and no manner of status or amount of money could solve his problem. He was like Naaman of the Old Testament, who discovered that leprosy is no respecter of people. I cannot help but imagine how empty this man must have felt as the sound of his son's mourning and crying echoed through the hallways of his home. Here he is with everything money could buy, but the sickness of his son had leveled him to the level of the poorest subject in his kingdom. All that he had, all of his power, all of his prestige, and all of his money meant nothing to him. For the life of his son was about to end. There's a proverb that says, not a biblical proverb, but just a proverb that says, grief is a black camel that kneels down in front of everyone's tent. <laughs> and I think that's true. There's not one of us sitting here, not one of us listening in any of the chapels across the, across the county or on the radio or on television. Not one of us will get from the cradle to the grave without visiting trouble. Trouble comes to everyone. Oh, yes, we have some wonderful days of joy and excitement, and I'm not a pessimist by any means. I look forward every day optimistically to all the good things that God is doing. But inevitably, just because it's a part of life, everybody has to experience grief. I thought of that yesterday when I watched the funeral from Great Britain. It was uh, an amazing thing. Only 31 people came to that service because of COVID. This, the death of, of Philip, you would have thought, would have been met with thousands of people coming to mourning, but only 31 people came. And if I live to be 100, I will never forget the picture of the queen after everyone has left sitting there all alone in her black robe as they lowered her husband into the vault below. Grief comes to everyone, no matter who it is, no matter how much money you have, how much wealth you have, whatever status you have, sooner or later, you'll have to face it. And that's not a negative statement, that's just reality. There's a proverb in the Bible that speaks of it this way. It says that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. <laughs> in other words, it's inevitable that sometimes you're gonna face trouble. It's not about trouble coming to you, it's about how you handle it, what you do with it, how you work through it, how you manage it. Like this nobleman, the powerful and wealthy have the same kind of sickness and sorrow that everyone has. How many of you know that sickness and sorrow brings everybody to the same level? I know wealthy men, I've actually had some tell me, I would give every wealth I have, every dime I have, every penny I have, if I could find a cure to the disease that I have or that one of my loved ones had. So Christ in a great sorrow, here is a senator, a man of great standing and status who has sorrow. Now notice Christ, secondly, and a great salvation, verses 47 to 50. This nobleman's sorrow brings us to the second part of our story, a great salvation. His sorrow was almost unimaginable, but it opened the door to the ultimate salvation of his entire family. Please note the sincerity of this man. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea and was in Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Now the, the nobleman experienced a little bit of hope. He had lost hope, but then someone told him that the prophet Jesus was in Cana of Galilee. He heard that Jesus had come to this little village. Perhaps the story of the water and the, and the wine had filtered out through the suburbs of Cana, and, and he had heard that there was a miracle-working prophet 
who had come to Cana. Cana was 20 miles from where this man lived. He lived in Capernaum. Cana was 20 miles. Notice he said he went to him, come down and heal his son. The interesting thing is that Cana was above Capernaum. And the nobleman experienced a glimmer of hope that if he could just get to where Jesus was, maybe something good could happen for his son. So the scripture says he went to Canaan. And he went all the way up to Canaan. It was an uphill walk. But you know, when you have a mission, and it's a really important mission, walking uphill is no big deal. <laughs> when you know how important your mission is, you're, you're on this mission for your son's health and safety and life. He walked up that hill, steep as it was, with no, no concern. And the Bible says that when he got into Cana, when he arrived, he implored Jesus to come to Capernaum and heal his son. Now, the word implored is an interesting word because in the original language, it means the man begged Jesus continually, not just once or twice. The idea was that he followed Jesus all around Cana, wherever Jesus went, and he kept saying, Lord, please come and heal my son. Lord, please come and heal my son. He was, he was just overwhelmingly devoted and committed to the importance of Jesus coming to Capernaum to heal his son. Now, it may feel like sometimes when you want something from the Lord, you are pestering him. Do you ever pester God? <laughs> Every, you all laughing a little bit about that because you have. And you probably think, God probably wishes you'd go away. Stop bothering him. Stop pestering him. But I want to tell you, you can't over-ask God. Did you know that? The Bible actually honors your persistence in prayer. Let me read to you a little story from Luke 11, and you'll remember the story, but I'll just read it right from the Scripture, and you'll get what I'm talking about. Jesus said to them, Which of you have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him, and he will answer from within and say to you, do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot arise and give to you. Jesus said, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, because of his persistence, he will rise and give to him as much as he needs. So I say to you, said Jesus, and here's that famous verse, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Literally, the text is saying, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Philip Yancey said, if a cranky neighbor who has turned in for the night and wishes more than anything that you would go away, does his best to ignore you? If such a neighbor eventually gives you what you want, how much more will God respond to your bold persistence in prayer? So don't be embarrassed that you keep asking God. Don't ever quit. I often have thought about my friend Howard Hendricks who prayed for his father for 37 years every day until just before his father died, he became a Christian. Don't ever give up in your praying. This man was... He, he was persistent. He followed Jesus everywhere, praying in his own words to Jesus, please come and heal my son. I want you to notice, secondly, not only this nobleman's sincerity, but his simplicity. He said to Jesus, unless you, and Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Now, hang on to that statement for just a moment. Jesus is basically addressing the people who are in the congregation and he is scolding them a little bit because they seem to follow Jesus around. They're not interested in Jesus. They're interested in his miracles, in his wonders, his signs. And he said, unless you see a sign, you won't believe. But the nobleman, interestingly enough, was not offended by Jesus' words, and he responded with a simple kind of faith. The nobleman said to him, verse 49, Sir, calm down before my child dies. Don't let my son die. 
You see, the nobleman refused to get caught up in the debate about signs and wonders. He was single-minded in his pursuit. He had one thing on his heart, and that was that his son could be healed. And I've mentioned in my own notes here how single-minded we get when we face a crisis. Isn't that interesting? Uh, When you're fighting for your life, you could care less what color they paint your house. (laughs) Amen? I've just noticed that when I've gone through hard times, difficult seasons, your agenda gets real short, your focus gets really clear, and you know exactly what you need. This man wasn't interested in debating. Uh, He wasn't even sure he had come for the right reason. He didn't know if he came because of the signs or not. He didn't care. All he knew was that he had a sick son, and he wanted Jesus to come and heal him. That was his agenda. That was the only thing that mattered. And we all understand that. We know that when we're sick, if someone gives us a bad report, we are focused on one thing. I have found that life gets very simple, very fast, when we're facing a crisis. Now notice, first of all, his sincerity and his simplicity. Finally, his surrender. And this is the key part of the story. This is the, this is the climax of the story if, you, if you're looking at it as a, as a drama. Jesus gave the nobleman a direct but surprising answer to his continual begging that Jesus come down to Capernaum and heal his son. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your son lives. Now, Jesus didn't say that because he was upset with the man because he was so persistent. This was a test of this man's faith. And I must confess to you that this man had begged Jesus to come down to Capernaum because he believed that Jesus could heal close at hand, but he wasn't too sure if he could heal at a distance. Uh, Perhaps the nobleman had heard about Jairus' daughter who was healed by the touch of the Lord. Or maybe the woman who had an issue who had touched the Lord's garment and she had gotten healed. But both of these were near at hand to where Jesus was. I want you to put yourself in this man's shoes and I want you to get inside his skin for just a moment. I want you to think about this. When Jesus told the nobleman to return home without him, he must have experienced this crisis. One he believes, the the one he believes to be the only hope for his son's healing, and he's walking away from him. He's leaving Jesus 20 miles behind, and he's going home without any tangible evidence that anything has happened, that anything is different. If he does that, he's left Jesus behind. If he stays and doesn't do what Jesus tells him to do, he has insulted the one to whom he has come for help what would you have done? Most of us would have probably said, Lord Jesus, you're my healer, and I'm hanging on to you, and I'm not leaving you until you heal my son. I'm not getting away from the source. I'm hanging on to it. I'm staying here. I'm staying here until I hear word that my son is healed. But the Bible says, The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. There must have been something in the calm of the Lord's voice, something in the glance of his eyes, that caused this man to believe that he could trust what Jesus had said before he saw it. And so he went his way, carrying on with his business for the rest of the day. This is the most important and incredible thing. He didn't just get home if, this had, if I had been this man and Jesus said, go home and your, your son will be healed, I'd have gotten home a lot faster than I got. And actually, it was downhill, so he could have made some time. <laughs> the Bible says he didn't go home right away. He stayed and carried out his business, and then he went home. James Montgomery Boyce said the man came, he talked to Jesus, and then went his way without any tangible evidence that his request had been granted. Because in meeting Jesus and in talking with him, his anxiety evaporated. And it can be the same for you, said said Boyce. You may be weighed down under great burdens. You may be crying inside. If you come to Jesus and you tell him about it, he will be delighted to ease your burden and take the weight of them all upon himself. He's the one who said, come unto me all ye that are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The nobleman thought Jesus would heal his son up close, but Jesus healed him from a distance. 
Isn't it interesting how we try to put Jesus and God in a box? God, we want you to do this for us, and here's how we'd like you to do it. Here's the way we'd like you to carry it out. And then we don't understand when God does it in a different way. But we're listening today to a message about the creator of the universe, and he's not bound by our system. If you go through the New Testament, you will see that. As you study the miracles of Jesus, you discover he used all kinds of methods. Uh, When he healed the leper, he touched him. When he healed Peter's mother-in-law, he lifted her up. When he healed the blind man, listen to this, he made clay out of spittle and put it on his eyes. When he dealt with the paralytic, he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. When he multiplied the loaves, he bowed and gave thanks. When he walked on the water and stilled the storm, he said, peace be still, it is I, don't be afraid. When he raised up Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he healed the nobleman's son, he simply said a word, and 20 miles away, it was done. If this miracle teaches us anything, it teaches us not to fall into the trap of thinking that Jesus can heal only in certain ways or circumstances. The Lord that you and I serve is not bound to our schedule and he's not subject to our understanding. He is the Lord of glory. If you've listened over the years to the testimonies from our baptistry, you have discovered several things. First of all, many of the people who come to Christ come to Christ because of trouble. Did you hear that young man's testimony today? all the things they went through, and ultimately they came to Christ. And you will also discover that they find Christ in so many different ways, through radio or television or the church or some neighbor or a small group or a Sunday school class. God brings these people to himself. And the methods are not important. It's the message that should never change. The message of the gospel is inviolable. It cannot change. The methods that God uses through all of us to bring people to himself, there are as many as there are of us. Now, what happened next is Jesus and a great salvation. Notice verse 51. And as this man was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. And this is the most unique part of this story as far as I'm concerned. I I read this over and over and think, is this what I would have done? I don't think so. So they came to him. He's on his way back down to, to Capernaum. And on his way back down, he sees his servants coming up toward him. And they run up to him and they say, your son lives. He's not dying. He's well. And you know, if that had been me, I would have I mean, I would have jumped around and put my hands up in the air and praised God and all of that. You know what this guy did? He said, what hour was it when he got better? What time did he get better? And they said yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed and his whole household. What was he doing? He was checking Jesus out. He was trying to find out if this man who had said what Jesus said was for real. He was affirming his belief. He went home because he believed, but now he's affirming his belief. He's saying, okay, if he, if he got well, what time was it? And they, and they told him, and he said, mm-hmm. Same time, Jesus told me he was healed. Now, notice this little small phrase, your son lives It's in verse 50 and it's in verse 51. The nobleman's servant had no idea why the son suddenly got better. They only knew that their master had gone seeking help and when they saw their master in the distance, they set off after him and said with excitement, your son is alive, he's alive. And instead of rejoicing with his servants, the nobleman asked for the hour. (laughs) I'll never get over that. He wanted to know if this was a Jesus miracle or just a medical miracle. He was trying to confirm his heart, and the servants told him, yesterday at the seventh hour, if we do the math together, we will notice something very interesting. If the nobleman had left town at the seventh hour, one in the afternoon, a day earlier, he would easily have arrived home by five o'clock that same evening, assuming that he rode by horse. But John says he spent the night in Cana and returned to Capernaum the next day. In other words, 
He believed so thoroughly in Jesus' healing power that he stayed in Cana for a little while longer without any further worry for his son. And when he found out that his son had been healed, he just wanted to prove to himself and everybody else that he was right. Jesus said at the seventh hour, when did he get healed? At the seventh hour, this is a Jesus thing. Jesus did this. And the Bible says in verse 53, so the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to believe, and the son lives, and he himself believed in his whole household. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we already say that this nobleman had believed in Jesus back in verse 50? I want you to notice something very interesting. There are three kinds of belief in this story. First of all, there's, there's faith in the power of Christ. How did this man get engaged with Jesus? He heard about his power. He heard about his miracles. Verse 47 says, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for it was at the point of death. Initially, the nobleman sought Jesus out because he had seen the signs and wonders of Jesus. He believed in his power and he wanted to know more about him. The nobleman's faith was in what Jesus had done and what God could do for his little boy. That's the first kind of faith, faith in the power of Christ. But then he exhibited a different kind of faith, and that was in the promise of Christ. In verse 50, the second kind of faith goes beyond faith in the power of Christ. We see this faith in the promises of Christ. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives, watch. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he did what Jesus told him to do. Let me tell you, this kind of faith is getting close to saving faith, because when you say you believe in something, it will make certain that you do something about it. It's not just a head knowledge. It's just not accepting a, a group of facts that you, I, I believe in Jesus. You know, just about everybody believes there's a Jesus. I believe in God. Oh, yes, I believe in God. That's not faith. Faith is believing and then acting upon your faith. This man said, Jesus told me to go home. I believe Jesus. I'm going home. That was faith in the promises of Christ. Someone has said, faith is taking the first step when you don't see the rest of the staircase. <laughs> when we have a saying in our world that goes like this, seeing is believing, but when it comes to faith, believing is seeing. It's exactly the opposite. This man believed and he responded. What this man experienced was then something uniquely wonderful, faith in the very person of Jesus Christ. First of all, he had faith in his power. He heard about his healing. Then he had faith in his promises. Go home, your son is alive. And then the Bible says he believed and his whole household. What did they believe? They believed in Jesus, the son of the living God. Their whole house, the whole family, the servants who work there, the household is a word that includes the extended family and all the servants. There was a little mini home revival that day when that house heard about Jesus. Hmm. Isn't it interesting, men and women, that when a, when a man believes the whole family usually believes. I've actually read statistics. 90% of the time when a father or a husband believes, oh, the rest of the whole family become Christians. It's amazing. And I've watched that in my ministry over the years. If you get the father saved, the whole family will become Christians. Now, ladies, it's not the same with you, although your salvation is just as important as your husband's. But your husband's salvation somehow cast a wide swath over your family. And men, that should put a lot of re uh, responsibility on you. I want to say pressure because that's a good word too. It's not just about you. You may be content in your life to wander your way through life without any faith in Jesus Christ, but are you okay with your children being like that? Are you okay with your children not having an example in their father of a man who loves God and wants to serve him? Over the years, I have seen so many wonderful things happen when a father comes to Christ. And I want to say to you men, if you're here, if you don't know Jesus Christ, sometimes this is a, a, a pride thing. Sometimes this is a matter of humility, being willing to say, I, I need Jesus Christ in my life. But when you do that, 
what you're doing is far beyond your own personal salvation. It has a great impact. And the Bible says, when this man believed, his whole family believed. It's so interesting to me that problems and difficulties are the way Jesus moves from one level of faith to the next. We want to push those things away, but God uses them to draw us to himself. Then we have Christ and a great sign. Christ and a great sign. Jesus tells us in the next verse that this again is the second sign that Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Jesus ends the story of the nobleman's son by reminding us that just like turning water into wine was a sign, this also is a sign. This is sign number two. These signs are all meant to point us to Jesus. The turning of the water into wine reminds us that Jesus can take something that's insufficient and make it totally sufficient. He can take what is old and make it new. He can make wine out of water, just like he changes our lives when we trust in him. The second miracle shows us that Jesus is not bound by latitude or longitude. He can save you wherever you are. He can do a miracle 20 miles away. He can speak a word and everything changes. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Let me remind you of the key purpose statement for this whole series. It's John 20, verse 31. These are written. What are these? These signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why do we have these stories in the Bible? Just so the preacher has something to preach about? No. These stories are included in John's gospel because the purpose of John's gospel is to prove to us that Jesus is God. And these seven signs he chose from the many miracles that Jesus did, he chose these seven particularly to point to us the importance of believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Who can turn water into wine? Only Jesus can do that. Who can heal a boy 20 miles away from the pronouncement of healing? That's a Jesus thing. What he wants us to know is that Jesus isn't just an ordinary teacher. He is the teacher himself. He is the Son of the living God. And the miracles that he did were done not to bring applause from those who watched, not to make him famous, but to prove that he was who he claimed to be. He did these miracles before there was a Bible that could be validating. He did these miracles to prove that he was who he claimed to be. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. He is the Son of the living God. And these are written that you may believe that, and that believing you may have life in his name. So the question then becomes, do you believe that? Do you believe in Jesus? I have been thinking deeply about these things over these last weeks. During the pandemic, we were restricted to some degree in our ability to invite people to come and receive Christ. Although we preached the gospel and many people got saved over the internet, many people got saved and told us that they got saved. But I am convinced, men and women, that this pandemic has brought us to the precipice of perhaps one more chance for us to preach the gospel and win people to Jesus Christ. And I'm not alone in that assessment. I believe that we have one more window, one more opportunity to publicly and unapologetically de declare that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. So what are we going to do with that? We, are we going to just sit on it and see if that's true? No, we must use this opportunity to tell people about Jesus, to help them understand that he is who he claimed to be, that he is the only one who can change a person's life, that as we read in the scripture, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So if you're here today or listening to this message in some way, and you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, let me tell you, 
You don't want to count on having a lot of opportunities in the future. If God is speaking to you today, if he's talking to you in your heart, this is your day. This is your time. Not tomorrow, not some other, oh, I'm going to go home and pray about this, Father, uh, Pastor. I'm going to go home and think about it. I'm going to go home and talk to my wife. No, you know in your heart if God is calling you to himself. You know. Every one of us here who became Christians in the past, we know there was a moment when God spoke to our life. Is he speaking to you? Do you know what he wants to do for you? He wants to make you just as new as water into wine and just as alive as life out of death. That's what he wants to do. He wants to give you a new life. He wants to forgive your sin. He wants to give you the hope of heaven. He wants to take away the fear of death. He wants to give you a love for your brothers and sisters like you could not imagine. He will do that for you, but you must say yes, because Jesus Christ will not push his way into your life. He comes only by invitation. If you want to know him, you have to invite him to come into your heart and into your life. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that as we bow for this closing prayer. Let's pray. And now, Father, we rejoice as we look back on this story for this man whose son was restored to life and uh, this family that was changed and they all believed. And there's someone who's listening to me today who needs to believe, who needs to declare that they believe in Jesus Christ and that they want him to be their Lord and Savior.